Good morning. Please welcome to the stage the president of the University of Southern California, Carol Folt. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's great to see you all, and I know we've got a lot of people signing on line, too, so welcome to all of you. And I'm just going to jump right in. So I want you to start the morning thinking about this wonderful phrase, everything, everywhere, all at once. Okay, of course, that's the name of this year's Oscar-winning Best Picture. And I think you all know that USC SCA alum, He Hui Kwan, won the Oscar for his brilliant performance in the film. And this might not be the only TV or movie title you hear nestled like Easter eggs in my remarks today. Not only was that film mind-bending, if you watched it, you'll know what I mean, the title really does capture our imagination, and I think it captures the tenor of our times. Here we are, 2023, contemporary life at warp speed, fast and furious, new technologies, we've got pioneering healthcare, treatments changing expectations, everything taking place in every area. We're truly living in the proverbial winds of change every single day. And if you think about those winds, the dem demography is changing, everybody needs new skills, there's a changing nature of work, and I don't need to tell any of you about the changing nature, the STEM revolution. These issues and more are sweeping us into what I would call a swirl of very confusing signals, and it can be a lot to take in. That swirl, of course, is magnified at universities because we're on the front line for all the big, tough societal and political issues. Now, we're very fortunate at USC because we aren't going to be forced or choose to go backward in any of those areas. We'll continue to honor, support, and learn from the experiences of our diverse and our global communities. We'll support the incredible multitude of voices and perspectives and ideas, and that's, of course, what makes universities such compelling forces for change. Of course, with the Dobbs decision last year, people here and I also stated publicly that USC is a leading educational institution with a major healthcare system, must continue to champion safe access to women's reproductive health care. So we'll take our stands where we can. Now, let's return to thinking, though, about that everything, everywhere, all at once. One of the countless privileges we have is that we're tasked to help our students and society transform what can feel like a frenzy into work that will improve humanity and help people build lives of purpose. And I see that happening every single day on our campuses at USC. 49,000 students, almost 30,000 staff and faculty across 22 schools, hospitals, clinics. Every imaginable endeavor is taking place someplace here. Everything from patient care to accounting, from dance to engineering. And you add to that our 450,000 plus alumni, the Trojan Network, and our impact and our reach is really staggering. The creative output from here is enormous. The research is turning uh, chaos into cleverness, and our people take and turn panic into purpose. That's what so many of you do. Our academic and our clinical programs are providing opportunities for complementary and competing ideas to both co collide and coexist, and therefore then transform the future. I truly believe that our work together matters more than it ever has. And I'm so honored to be your president and to be here with you today. So today, what I want to do is take you out of the part of the university that you know best and try to spur you to ponder what it means to be a part of the greater, the whole USC. It's a bit like the story of people trying to describe an elephant while they're blindfolded. So I'm gonna try to give you a view of that elephant from what is really my very privileged vantage point as president of the entire university. I hope when you leave today, you'll take away 
a greater appreciation for the people from every walk of life who are here truly doing with purpose everything, everywhere, all at once. See, every time I clap, you'll get to say that now. <laughs> so let's get started talking about our students. They are such a vibrant group. Our students, remember this, they're learning and growing and flourishing every day. And we're adding resources to support them every year. At KSOM, for example, we've seen record numbers of graduate and professional applications since 2001. Currently, we have almost 3,000 students and trainees, medical students, graduate students, residents, fellows, and about 1,000 undergraduates studying here. We have 8,600 doctors, nurses, and clinicians, and caregivers serving more than 300,000 patients a year. That's a large reach. The faculty and staff across the university are also incredibly energetic, conducting groundbreaking research, digging into political and societal issues, providing amazing educational innovations in every discipline. We have people designing world-class buildings, launching new businesses, creating innovative digital media, while also delighting global audiences on the stage and screen. Here at HSC, you're conquering health issues with new therapeutics, you're finding ways to eliminate healthcare disparities, and of course you're improving and often saving lives. You're also helping the most needy with street medicine and mobile dental clinics, for example. And I want to say this work is noticed and it is appreciated. Just consider the more than 500 mentions in the New York Times alone this year about that work. Moreover, more and more of you are taking your ideas and discoveries to market. From You're taking your research from bench to bedside and increasingly to the phone. Just last week, I visited an amazing carbon capture project taking place on the UPC campus just around the corner from my office. And they are literally pulling CO2 out of the water on large shipping vessels and they're sequestering it into inert compounds and therefore helping to slow the specter of climate change. If you're like me, USC becomes much more exciting, you know, sort of the size and the weight of that elephant becomes much clearer. Every time I explore our world from outside, when you go out of your school, your department, or your activity, and look at all the things that are happening. And I urge you, just like I urge all of our students, to really take advantage of the amazing grand opportunities here. We all get to rub shoulders with leading thinkers of a generation, many of them sitting right in here with us. And we can seek out a great diversity of thought and culture, which is thriving on our campuses and throughout the city and the region. We can generate new ideas with people outside our own sphere of influence, and we can connect with our neighbors and our incredible Trojan network. So it's a rare privilege really to be part of such a community. And I believe we should do our best to enjoy it. But we also have to continually try to improve it for people who follow after we are here. Now 2023 has been a really, an area, I, a year I would characterize as purpose and pushing. We have faced down challenges that come only once in a lifetime. And yes, the most serious global pandemic in more than a century affected all of us. But of course, you were all on the front lines. You know, you were steering our health system and our associated schools to protect and care not only for the USC community, but for millions of fellow Angelinos. From my view, our commitment to each other and to our university only grew stronger during that time. USC is really on the move, and I think you can see that every place you look. And the state of the university is actually quite strong. We're thriving in so many ways, and I'd like to show you why I feel very confident when I say that. So our strength believes with our, begins with our ambitious and diverse undergraduate, graduate, and professional students. Yes, they say they come here in part by our sunshine, 
maybe not today. But they're also drawn to what they see as a culture of optimism, of big dreams, of inclusion, and increasingly they talk about multidisciplinary fusion that really excites them. They're very curious, they're motivated, and they come from every background imaginable. Here's one example about students that you may not know. USC also has an incredible legacy of more than 100 years of ROTC on campus. We may be the only university in America that never closed down its ROTC programs. We have almost 300 students in all branches of our programs. Each year, we have 1,000 undergraduate and graduate student veterans enrolled, and a lot of them are over here in the health science campus. Our faculty and staff include more than 400 veterans also sitting here on our board of trustees. And here's a fun fact. Today, five members of our Air Force program are commissioning into the newest branch of the military, the U.S. Space Force. There were only 130 cadets chosen nationwide, and most universities had only one or two selected. So that talks about the quality and the strength of our students. You probably all see this, but our students are also self-starters, and that is a very good sign for what is to come. A highlight um, this year was the development of USC's first ever student commitment, and not a lot of people know about that. This was an amazing endeavor, and it stands as a blueprint, not a binding pledge, but it's a blueprint for living USC's unifying values. I urge you to read it online. And the students were a big part of creating it. Many of you may also not know that Student Affairs, with the help of the provost and a, a number of faculty, completely revamped our student judicial system, which all of us participate in, called SJAX, this year. And that is a big lift to completely revamp something like that with a completely different student-centered approach. And people are really enjoying it. We're, well, I don't know if you enjoy the judicial system, but they're appreciating it. And I think that's uh, something that I think we should all feel proud of. Now, momentum, being on the move, also always builds from recruiting and retaining inspiring academic leaders, faculty, and staff. So I'd like to introduce you to a few of the new leaders. You see their pictures up there. You may have met them. There's Julia Ritter for the Kaufman School. Jason King will be joining us soon, Thornton School. Josh Kuhn is taking on a role as the first vice provost for the arts. Now he's incredible, he's an Annenberg professor, MacArthur fellow, and he is the perfect inaugural leader for this position. He's already working on collaboration among our deans, our museums, the rest of our campus, including many of the health science campuses that work with the arts. So this is a great uh, step for us. We also brought Arcadia Hospital into our roster of hospitals and just recently appointed a new leader, Ike Mayjay, the CEO of Arcadia. Scott Rabinald, who I think is here, is the new SVP for University Advancement. Ishwar Puri, whom you know, moved into the newly created role as SVP of Research and Innovation. And we also just welcomed law enforcement veteran Loretta Hill to USC to be the new chief of DPS. So if you haven't met them, I hope you do. These are wonderful people. Our faculty also continue to garner national and international awards and make such great advances. Eleven professors this year were inducted into prestigious national academies. And that really is a testament to the excellence of their scholarship. And remember, that comes from recognition from their peers across the world. So that's pretty exciting. We also just announced eight new university and distinguished professors, including Dean Hatsi Combe, Tom Buchanan, and Lourdes Bayakande Garbunaiti. Sorry, Lourdes, if I mispronounced your last name. <laughs> and you know how wonderful the faculty are that are selected for those positions, so congratulations. This you might not know, we actually hired 351 full-time and 519 part-time faculty this year. So that pool continues to grow and to bring new ideas in. 
Advising is also high on our minds in every area, and we're soon about to launch a program I really want you to know about. It's called Advise USC. It will be one of our largest student and faculty-focused technology initiatives ever. So we're hoping that's going to really streamline and make things uh, work much more smoothly. So thank you to the people that have been working on that. On the research front, USC grants continue to grow. With our funded grants in 2022 rising 8% above the 2021, getting right there into that $1 billion club. But maybe what impresses me even more was how hard people are working on it. More than 3,500 proposals valued at $3.5 billion were submitted this year. But this is the number that is so extraordinary. 40% were awarded. You all sit on panels, you know that that number is usually less than 10%. That exceptional number places USC researchers among the very top of the top in the country. And I don't have to tell you that groundbreaking research often requires groundbreaking funding. So we're glad that people are doing that. There are a lot of examples, it's wonderful, but here's a figure that gives me great hope. And that's USC's federal funding for Alzheimer's and related studies on dementia has eclipsed over a billion dollars alone in the past 10 years. And so many of you in all our schools are involved in this critical research, including both Dean Meltzer and Dean Cohen. So it's an area of great strength. Now, given the success of our researchers, we kind of know if we build it, they will come. And we know also they're going to excel. So we're really excited about that new Discovery Translational Hub right here at HSC and our recently opened CGMP facility. I was so excited when I got to learn about that. That is going to make a big difference for us. It's going to include space for 84 researcher groups. Many of those will be new add-on positions from Keck, from MAN, from Ostro. It'll have a workforce in it of at least 850. It's going to be such a dynamic place. It will take us one step closer to what is, I think, our ambitious goal of doubling our research in seven to 10 years. I actually think we're gonna do it faster if we get these facilities going. And of course, I really want to say this, across the board, it's the quality of research, the quality of clinical practice and the creative arts that really drives impact. Yes, grants are important, but it's so much more important what the outputs really are. And that includes the discoveries, it includes the books, the artistic creations, the new medicines, therapies. It's everybody's national leadership. It's community involvement, the people that we touch, that together with the success of our graduates is what really drives our impact and our reputation. Now, I'm also happy to report that our financial position is strong. Yet, of course, in the current environment, we have to continue to have very, very careful management. And I think you all know Keck's medicines finances remained healthy, healthier than most anyone in the country throughout FY22 with a positive 3% margin. But during the second half of 2022, national trends caught up with us like they are with everyone uh, and expenses continue to rise due to high labor costs, supply costs, and changes in the way the insurance providers return our funds. But I'm going to tell you, this team, I'm so proud of them. The whole system has undertaken a very aggressive plan to mitigate and um, aggressively close those gaps, enhance our revenues. And I see these results already paying off. I couldn't be more pleased with how people are really addressing it. I have never seen a team work this hard. And that's our finance team across the university. They have been doing an, an excellent job managing budgets. And I want you to think about this. This year, and I think this is actually extraordinary when you put it together. Yes, we balanced our budget. We better balance it every year. That itself should not be extraordinary. But in extraordinary times, it can be. We balanced our budget. But we also continued to make strategic investments in compensation, student aid, and some pretty wonderful capital projects. But this is the other thing. We did this at the same time that USC paid off nearly $2.5 billion in our legacy legal issues and in our COVID expenses. So that took a lot of work and it puts us in a very different position going forward. 
and I'm just so grateful to people who did it. But we also have to and are continuing to diligently manage the risks associated with potential downturns in the markets and inflationary pressures. So that's something we're all a part of. Now, on the advancement front, our donors and our rating agencies are expressing optimism about USC's future. So that's always very good to see. Our ratings actually were improved this year. Um, last year, we raised $770 million in pledges and gifts, and we're in the process of launching new campus-wide, you know, the, the launching the campaign here, as well as school-specific fundraising initiatives. So I really see that this will continue to grow. Now, we can't continue to fund everything, everywhere, all at once, but we will continue to invest in important capital projects and programs like the new $10 million generative AI center that we announced just last week. So we don't stand still, we keep moving forward. We'll also continue to make strategic investments across the campus and increasing those, Lee, those include people from both campuses working together. Next month, we're having a topping off ceremony. I think a number of you will be there for the Dr. Allen and Charlotte Ginsburg Human-Centered Computation Hall, which will be our new home for computer science, and also that work involves a number of you. You may not know, but we've also made a, a great investment in an upgraded home for our SDA, our Dramatic Arts, in our Arts Corridor, which has Thornton, Kaufman, IYA, the Cinematic Arts, and it is a beautiful historic building that will have modern spaces for rehearsals and performance. And they did this without having to do anything to the historic, beautiful building. And these buildings all will generate a significant increase in our capacity. And the more people we bring in and the great job we do, that has a very positive effect, speeding up research, discovery, outreach in the research and in the arts and social sciences across campus. We're also doing a lot to seed other projects across the university, you may not know about that, but for instance, under Ishwar, our Office of Research and Innovation provided more than $2 million in seed funding during just the first two months of 2023 alone. And that went into projects including facilities, it went into the arts and sciences, the humanities, social sciences, and engineering. And I think that is making a big difference for people as they get their work going. Now, we have an extraordinary number of strong, long-standing collaborations with our communities. That is particularly noticeable here, but it's throughout the entire campus. And that goes through our K-12 schools, our public health system, and our local businesses. These relationships are growing, and many, many of them are closely allied with the health system. You know, we're more committed than ever to serving the residents of LA County as part of our commitment with the LA County Hospital. So we're working hard on that relationship. We've been working together with them for over a century, almost 140 years, and so I, I'd say we're looking to 140 more, and we just have to continue to make that relationship work. So I'm gonna set, uh, share a fast five examples of community collaborations that I think that you'll find pretty interesting. So to start, Thursday, we're opening our eighth Head Start Center near the UPC campus, and a ninth one is coming right here in Boyle Heights soon. That is a big effort on our university's part and such a rewarding one. In fact, our, child, our early childhood centers serve more than 600 low-income children in neighborhoods adjacent to HSC and UPC. Our street medicine program, which you all know so much about, is providing health, of course, to unhoused Angelinas, but it has become a national model, and it was the subject of my conversation over breakfast with the new mayor just last week. So that is such a fabulous uh, part of our outreach and impact. The Herman Ostro School of Dentistry spent its last year restarting all the community health clinics and fairs that had been closed or significantly curtailed by our own contagion, COVID-19. In November, the Susan Duarte Peck School of Social Work launched a trauma recovery center. 
with a big impact in the community. It's the first victim recovery behavioral health clinic at USC. And it's going to provide free and safe mental health services to survivors of crime and violence and trauma in LA. Fifth one I'm going to show is our USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology. And they're partnering with local nonprofits to help older Angelinos age in place, particularly those living in areas surrounded, surrounding USC. And the list goes on and on. Now the final reason I say USC is so clearly on the move stems from the momentum I see then in all of our schools. And in fact, you may not know it, but USC is at the top of leading research universities for the number of highly ranked schools. So I'm going to share two examples of momentum among the hundreds out there. First, under the USC Institute of Addiction Science, we're offering a new master's degree in addiction science, which will be the first of its kind to be offered at a major university. And trust me, people are really wanting that. It is melding social work, medicine, pharmaceutical efforts. It's a cross-disciplinary curricular platform. It involves Dwarak Peck, Kaysom, Mann, and I know many other parts of the university will get involved in it. And I know from having been at two other institutions that wanted to start such things, how needed this is. Second, the Turby was awarded an NSF grant recently to make coding available for persons living with physical disabilities. Our researchers developed personalized interfaces enhanced by AI to help them learn and practice programming skills. Now their goal is not small. They want to break down barriers for more than one billion people, which is 15% of the world's population who are living with disabilities. These Viterbi researchers are acting as avengers for social good. They're helping 80%, that's the goal, of people living with disabilities who were excluded from the 2021 workforce and helping them to get the skills and access needed to be part of this changing economy. So that's a lot of what's going on here now. I'm going to switch focus now to talk about USC's future. In my just over three and a half years here, I've been so impressed with the commitment to excellence in everything and by the extent to which I have seen our community embrace change. No more than what I've seen over here. And I love the fact that our mission, the guiding principles of our mission statement remain very relevant because they're designed for existing in a fast changing world. So again, I really urge you to read it. I look at it periodically. It's really a strong statement. But of course, to realize a mission depends on having a very powerful contemporary vision and a blueprint for action to bring it alive at this time. I see our blueprint being to increase our stature and impact by making USC, and I think it's totally possible, the international standard bearer for and innovator for collaborative learning and discovery. And I think we see ourselves as being the top choice for students, faculty, staff who are seeking purpose-driven work and purpose-driven lives. To achieve this vision, we have to build on our distinguishing traits and our distinguishing capabilities. So to begin, school, USC is really the school of schools in America. We have the most of those top schools of any of the big research universities. And at our size, you just have to think about when, you're s when you are large, everything we do affects a lot of people. We can rewrite the roadmap for higher education and healthcare. We can transform the professions. We're leaders in almost all of them. And maybe most importantly, we can make belonging and mattering feel very real for people and partner with our communities to improve health, fairness, and prosperity. And we're making significant progress on this vision within each academic unit and our schools and our clinics and, of course, with our university-wide moonshots. Talk about those for a minute. The moonshots have been being developed 
as strategies for cross-institutional collaboration. They're missions impossible, if you will. <laughs> Thought that you couldn't do them unless you really tried. Designed to increase national leadership for years to come. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to update you on them, starting with the moonshot that I call USC Competes. So USC w Competes was designed to attract and retain the best and the brightest in one of America's most expensive cities. This is part of our life here. I'm telling people who know that. That initiative includes financial aid. This is really important to me and I know to you. USC, though you might not know, enrolls more than 4,700 Pell-eligible undergraduates. That's more than almost any private research university in America. We might be close to NYU. We also have one of the largest financial aid pools in the nation. This year, $635 million in scholarships and grants went to our students. And in 2023-24, we expect that pool to increase by another 7%. Now, our successful affordability initiative is entering its fourth year. That initiative eliminates tuition completely for, fam for undergraduates making less than $80,000 a year. The impact has been great. About 21% of our first year students have benefited from this new program, and about one third of our incoming students are now first generation students. So it's really affording people a chance to come here. It represents about 22 million in additional annual funding to our students. So top of my agenda, our agenda now, is to focus on more aid for our transfer students, more aid for our graduate and professional students, and tuition, that's where we go next. It's really important. And we need to raise more than a billion dollars by the end of the decade to really make that come to life. USC Competes also has focused very directly on our dedicated faculty and staff. Last year, we began implementing a five-year, $700 million investment in increasing compensation, benef our benefits, looking at those to make sure we're doing the right things there and making market adjustments at all levels. So in year one, we exceeded a target of 150 million, and we included substantial raises, you may not know, for our graduate students, over 10%, postdocs, many of you helped pay for that, our RTPC faculty, as well as our staff, tenure and tenure track faculty, and all the people working throughout your units. I want to give a special shout out to our university-wide HR teams, because you don't probably know anything about this, but USC had to ensure compliance in record time, Felicia, I think it was a couple months, with a new law passed by the legislature called California's Pay Transparency Act. And it was legislated and then required to be in place in less than a couple months, and they did all that while doing everything else. And that just shows you how hard people work behind the scenes to, to get things done. The second moonshot is the transformation of USC Health Sciences. And I've reported previously on the governance changes, you're all living them, which include the Board of Trustees Healthcare Board, and it is doing such a great job, and also the alignment of our health-related schools under Dr. Steve Shapiro, sitting right here looking at him as the new SVP for Health Affairs. And it has been, I'm going to say, a tremendous success. I'm being told that the governance structure is speeding up new programmatic initiatives. People tell me they get to talk about this every time they get together. It's going to be a major force propelling the $3 billion campaign for health as we move forward. And it includes planning for faculty growth, for research support, and student aid. That's a big part of our campaign. And adding, growing, new building. These are big parts of our, our real uh, big commitment to this area. We're also making some other big investments, including our new partnership with Arcadia and the building of a 100,000 square foot medical office building in Pasadena, which you probably know includes an ambulatory surgery center, an imaging center, endoscopy center, and so much more. So we really do see this as a great opportunity for us to increase our impact. In November, though, we took what is a highly unusual step for a university, I actually don't know any place else that has done that, because we decided to reimagine 
the use of a marvelous gift from physicist, inventor, and former USC trustee, Alfred E. Mann. That gift, sitting in the endowment, had grown to more than $230 million in two decades. We had amazing partnership with the Alfred E. Mann Foundation directors because they had to sign off on this. And we were able to redirect those funds to areas we think would be much more productive for enabling growth in academic research and activities in the area of the gift was the intersection of health science, engineering, and basic sciences at USC. So we designated more than $100 million of it to go for supporting early investment in research, and it will also be adding new endowed chairs in biomedical engineering subject clusters that will bring together a number of schools. We also endowed both our newly named Alfred E. Mann School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, and we endowed the Mann Center for Biomedical Engineering at the Viterbi School. And stay tuned, we have a big announcement coming. We're about to announce a new joint biomedical research initiative and innovation between USC and, US and CHLA to improve children's health. So more on that soon. That has been a wonderful opportunity for people. Now, we have another moonshot to reimagine athletics, and I know you all care about this too. I hear from you about this many times. Um, and that, I'd say that initiative is also progressing well. And talk about a turbulent time, athletics in America is wild. But we're committed to the student athlete. We still determined to ensure that our student athletes can achieve at the highest level athletically and achieve at the highest level academically. Our new move to the Big Ten Conference next year is extremely important for us. It puts us on the national stage where we have a say in the issues of the day. It positions our programs and our athletes for long-term success and sustainability. And it gives us a strong voice in that national dialogue. And it's been a pretty great year for our teams as well with, of course, a huge football turnaround under coach Lincoln Riley who really walks and does the right things. Caleb Williams, I know you all saw, won the Heisman, gave the best speech anyone had ever seen. Our men and women's basketball teams both made it to the NCAA, didn't go far enough, but they will next year um, for the first time in almost one and a half decades. And we have many teams right now competing for national titles as we speak. But you may not all know that Keck Medicine takes care of our student athletes. They've been treating them, they provide our training, they do our support to ensure that our students can perform at their highest ability on the field and off and keep them well. So I think that's something we're also really excited about that partnership. And of course, this year we also have the honor of naming our main track field after Allison Felix. And I'm looking at Paula Cannon over there who had a lot to do with that. Um, Allison, as you all know, is the most decorated USC track and field athlete in the Olympics history. And she is a proud Racer alum, grew up right next to the UPC campus. But most importantly, she exemplifies winning the right way with honor, and she uses her voice to drive important change. So my hope is that when students and alumni walk by that field, named after Allison, they'll be inspired to learn more about her incredible story. Now, in the next few weeks, we're gonna publicly launch our fourth big moonshot, which I've talked about a number of times. That's a 10-year, billion-dollar-plus innovation uh, initiative to accelerate advanced computing at USC. I'm not gonna talk about it more because that big announcement will have a lot of the different components. But I do wanna say that this is not the first time USC is at the forefront of an exponential leap in technology. And in fact, you may not know, but Viterbi's uh, Information Science Institute, which we call ISI, helped develop the internet. They truly did, including the domain name system and TCP IP protocols that are the digital backbone of the web today. Now, finally, we're developing initial, additional moonshots as we speak, especially in areas like sustainability. Now, I could tell you, so there is so much 
going on there. You can look at some of those examples. Um, we had launched Assignment Earth, which was the first time the university has a whole framework for making it ourselves a more sustainable university and a more sustainable planet. They're achieving amazing milestones. One I particularly want to mention is that we're now purchasing renewable electricity from LADWP, the water power uh, part of the county, that is 45% less carbon intensive. So I'm taking a side here. UCLA and USC are the only two universities that are accelerating their carbon neutrality programs in part because we all get to have access to that great innovation. But this is a real win-win because as part of our, our agreement also ensures that our neighbors can purchase low-cost renewable energy. So it pushes everyone forward. The Keck School is also placing sustainability front and center, and I just love this, by addressing the healthcare industry's carbon footprint, finding key ways to reduce it, really out there ahead, and I, I'm just waiting to see more come from that. So what I hope I've done so far and through this talk is help you understand what I think is the true spirit of USC, maybe to appreciate that beautiful elephant uh, in its fullest form. But no matter what your own vantage point, I think you can see that it is a great time, a time of great promise for us, as well as a time of challenge. But I'm very confident as we go forward that we can continue in what is clearly a great Trojan tradition, that we can manage through serious challenges, but we can do it with an optimism, we can seize opportunities, and when we do that, we just go from strength to strength. To do it, though, it requires that kind of continued purpose and investment. We still need to add critical infrastructure. We absolutely have to manage our finances prudently, and in spite of all that, we need to continue to invest in the success of students, faculty, and staff. People first, always at the heart of what we do. We also, I believe, very strongly, you have to always keep raising the bar on ethics and values. And we have to use our beliefs, what we stand for, to improve the ways that we live and they work together. That student pledge, the new, uh, a number of initiatives taking place are all value-centered. For the first time, that makes a big difference. That's how we can become the exemplar for what I really do call excellence at scale. You know, it's not that hard to be big, but it's pretty hard to be excellent and big. So let me talk a little bit about what I mean when I say we can achieve excellence at scale. What does it take? Well, it takes size, it takes quality, it takes speed, all of those are important, but it really doesn't mean much if it doesn't have connection. Each year, USC's big. Okay, we are big. Big impact, lots of people, we affect them. Each year, we graduate more than 5,000 diverse undergraduates, 11,000 graduate students, and 2,300 of those are medical professionals. We enroll 13,000 international students, 27% of our student population. And an example of size, we actually produce right now the most and the most diverse uh, students in computer and information science in the country. So in an area of major change, what we and how we treat those students has a huge impact on the field as a whole. We're also, you, many of you may know, the largest private employer in the city of Los Angeles. And uh, we're one of only two university-based medical systems in this area. So how we treat people, what we do, influences a whole region. USC is excellent. Our schools are leaders in their fields, and they aspire to get even better. KSOM, for example, is number one in NIH funding per investigator. That is a big deal. Just take a breath. Think about what that means. Among the top 40 medical schools and seven Keck School departments led by our amazing physician scientists are top 10 in their fields. Also, with unlimited ambition to do even more. The Trojan call to excel, by the way, though, extends throughout 
the university. I told you about HR. I told you about the new advising season. Everybody wants to do things better. And you see our physician scientists, our architects, our artists, our engineers, our nurses, our IT specialists, our faculty, our staff, our groundskeeper, everybody is trying to do excellence. And we can do fast. And not a lot of places can say that, but we have a history of being bold and inclusive, starting programs and seeing them through. We take big swings and we do them with decisiveness. And that boldness often carries the day. When you have something you want to do, you take that leap and you do it well. But I would say again, as strong as you can be individually, you know, you can't build a bridge with just the piling. As strong as you can be individually, our biggest boost comes from the strength and the power of those bridges that we make across scale, the things that connect us. Connection, in my mind, is the most important element that's needed to achieve excellence and scale. And I believe that doesn't happen on its own. It happens because of so many people, but we need to do everything, even at the university, to foster that connection with every single tool we can bring. I could list many, many wonderful examples of connections that you're all already making, and I know that each one of you could come up with a dozen more. So I'm going to give three brief examples. First, I want to mention the Center on Artificial Intelligent Research for Health is a program that connects that ISI in Viterbi and Quezon and our Silicon Beach campus, which is another new growing area. It's fabulous. It connects. It's a collaboration between AI researchers and health science researchers. It's called AI for Health, and it's delivering some pretty exciting new discoveries, so stay tuned for that one. We're also collaborating with a lot of other universities, and that's also an important part of this. Keck researchers and peers have conducted, many of you know this, the largest ever genetic study of prostate cancer in men of African descent. Such important work, and this work is heading, leading us to new understandings of a very serious problem. Finally, the accountants at Leventhal are providing, uh, collaborating with Marshall and the IRS. Now, that might sound boring to you, but wait till you hear what they're doing. <laughs> they're providing 1,500 hours of volunteer tax service for our neighbors. They're assisting low-income residents in the communities surrounding UPC and HSC. And just listen to this. Last tax season, they secured over $600,000 in, in refunds for our, our neighbors. So as president, I am incredibly fortunate because I get to see this kind of amazing creative interplay all the time. And I hope you can see it too. People bring me problems, it's true, but I get so many these beautiful ideas come to me every day. And I want you to have that feel. <laughs> Excellence and scale really does define the best part of who we are, I believe, today. And I believe that captures our aspirations and our distinctions for the future. When you think about the challenges that face the world, I think you could agree with me that USC is a tremendous, tremendous force for good. Our nation truly needs educational, research, and healthcare institutions that have size and excellence and flexibility and a culture of community engagement and collaboration because that's what it takes to drive real change in such turbulent times. Not only are we uniquely positioned to address these tectonic shifts, you can look at some of these medallions up there, they tell you a lot about us, we're also primed to expand our reach in ways that are really important to humanity's future. And this just gives you an idea, you can see it up there, of just the various areas in which that size and scale is already working. And you start pulling them together, you just see that capacity grows. Finally, our new capital campus that's going to be in the heart of Washington, D.C.'s DuPont Circle, I think is another leap that places USC at the very center of our democracy, close to the West Wing, where we can play a much bigger role. And we're there, but now we're there in a big way. And it will grow too. 
um, research and policy decisions that drive the conversation take place in Washington, Sacramento, and LA, but that's a big one. We're gonna be there, we can have a very important seat at the table. So in closing, I'm gonna, ask a I'm gonna answer a question I often am asked, and that sort of in general encapsulate what USC's blueprint, what is USC's blueprint for success? What do we do that we think we do really well? Okay, I'm gonna start with a fiercely loyal and ambitious Trojan family. Everybody talks about it. They are so important to us, and they are mostly people who graduated from here. Okay, add to that, we have extraordinary academic strength and bre breadth. We have amazing resources, and our location is really a benefit for so much of what we wanna do. I think we have a relentless interest in self-evaluation. Don't underestimate how important that is. And we have some very ambitious goal setting. You don't get anywhere without those two. But I do believe that the most important aspect of our success, what really distinguishes us, is that we have a deep and an abiding commitment to placing our students, our patients, and humanity at the very core of what we do in the public and the human good. Our commitment to them powers our greatest journeys. So now before I end, I want to add a few thank yous. So first of all, thank you everyone for coming here today. I know you're all off, running off to go get started on your busy days. To our USC's leadership team, the Incredibles, I thank them, and that includes our teams here and on the, the campus in Bovard. They bring amazing diligence and resolve to steering our university, and they do it with joy. I wanna say about our dedicated board of trustees, we really could have no better stewards than the members of both of our boards. They're amazing too. And of course, our staff, our faculty, our students, especially I wanna point out those who are actively involved in shared governance. They do that as a freebie, but they do a lot to keep us vigilant in those areas. So grateful to them and our amazing staff, our buildings, our groundskeepers, the people that take care of us in every area, our hospitality, our event staff, our production team, DPS, on and on. Every one of them is ensuring that our university is moving efficiently, safely, and it's so beautiful on our campuses. And then I wanna say to our faculty and our students and our Trojan alums, and all of the healthcare scientists and the frontline workers. Truthfully, you make USC what it is, what it was, what it is, and what it will be, a truly modern family. <laughs> now, when I speak at commencement this year, I'm gonna feel a little teary-eyed because I've been here four years, I'm gonna feel like a senior graduating the class of 2023 after four pretty incredible years at USC. But I also really want to leave our students with a sense of hope and purpose. It's so important. Even from our inception in 1880, USC's connection to the surrounding community has been a core principle. That is another grand distinction. Our students, I believe, learned the importance of that great community relationship in their time here and they ultimately go out and become community builders, innovators, connectors, and that's what's gonna lead our world to a better future. People always have a choice. You know, you can see the future as daunting, and you can see other people and other places as something to fear, or you can see the future as connected, as meaningful, as filled with purpose and opportunity to create to help, to serve, to innovate. I choose to see USC's future as limitless, and I know that, that I share that with so many of you here as well. So I hope when people think about USC, they're gonna think about a place on the move where there is excellence in everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Fight on. <laughs>
so I know a lot of you have to run off, but I'm happy to take comments, ask questions. I've got a lot of other people here that could probably answer them if I can't or if they're really hard. So uh, <laughs> I'll just open it up. Um, anybody, question, comment, what are you thinking? You're like kids in a class. <laughs> Who's the first bold one? Okay, I think we have some coming from on line. I'm just gonna, I got one about um, Earth Month. Okay, I love Earth Month. I think I became an ecologist because of Earth Day. The first time I, I mean, I, honest, I really think that was a big part of it for me. I think I'm here because of Title IX, so you can go back and look at all the things that actually changed your life. But Earth Month's just a little bit away, and we have this amazing assignment Earth. It has been fabulous, and I see some of the leaders sitting here, and then learning recently about how much is going on right here. When Victor Zhao was here, he was so impressed with all the green initiatives, and I think, Steve, you're helping to serve on a board to look at the greening of medicine. So people have asked me, how do we think we're doing? Well, I think we've made extraordinary progress. If you looked at some of those ways we're saving, I mean, we eliminated plastic bottles faster than any of us ever thought was possible. Now, that doesn't mean they're not cropping up every once in a while, but people actually report them. In a not, not in a bad way, but they remind us, could you please remind them they shouldn't be having plastic bottles. I like to think those are all the ones that were in the storerooms, and they're using them up. But that was a big deal, but these, the water preservation, the waste diversion, and we started a postdoc program for the first time, five sustainability postdocs. Ishwar's been working with faculty. These are gonna be students and had an amazing pool coming to work in a number of different schools on those issues. We're gonna open the Sustainability Hub, which is a whole place dedicated in the center of the UPC campus. We should think about putting a Sustainability Hub over here. I think it'd be really um, important. So I think that is something really uh, important for us. Anybody out there with a hand? Okay, I'll answer another one here from Someone that just wrote it. Oh, did I miss one? Yes, thank you. You're brave. <laughs> Do you mind introducing yourself? I've got people sitting here who can tell you more, but one of the main, our biggest building thing right now is of course the new DTH. And also though there's quite a bit of money going into renovating spaces that are here. We bought Doheny, we did a lot. And as people have been thinking about that, even within those spaces, a lot of them are being constructed in a way, not your old fashioned lab, your old fashioned classroom, but ways that increase engagement capacity even in those buildings. That's what all the modern sort of space looks like. Also, in DTH, I believe we have a lot of intention to put some of those convening spaces, trying to also new, use the new hotel. We are limited here. We are absolutely footprint, you know, people don't want us to grow out into a new footprint. So everything we do here needs to be done in partnership with our community. So adding a lot of outside spaces is harder. It's either easier for us to reconstruct internal spaces. The, the news part of that is that every single time we do anything, and we've got earthquakes, we've got renovations, every time we do those, we try to think about sustainability, better use of the building, and all of those issues. So it's in every conversation. But I don't think I have a list of those, and I don't know that you have those, Carolyn or, or Steve. Yeah, they're really working on that, so it's important. Because you need to have that in that really that feeling. And even over at UPC, we're not looking outside our footprint. We're really looking inside our footprint. And not want, I don't want to get rid of green space. I said I am not going to be the person that fills in the green space with buildings. Not me. Somebody else might do that. But you need green space too. So you need to really think about how you're going to do that. Yeah, thanks. 
Okay, well, there's a good question here. And by the way, if you need to, we'll just do a couple more minutes because I know people want to get moving. Um, they said there's been a lot of employee attrition at USC over the fast last few years. And our school needs quality, sustainable employees who are committed. So what are we doing to do that retention? So first thing I'm going to say, there's been a lot of churn at every university and every healthcare system in America. And beyond that, in every business in America. We've had an awakening for people of what they want to do, how do they have work-life balance. So I would say we're not unusual, and we may, by the numbers, actually have less. On the other hand, I said earlier, we want to be the exemplar. And I think it is absolutely true. You want people to want to work here. So a couple things that I think Felicia would tell you, and I'm going to talk about at all levels, staff need to be able to see not only are they valued in their work matters, but they have a pathway ahead. So that requires adding training programs, and we are doing a lot of it. People also do not like to work in a silo. And I get a lot of fights every single time you try to bring people together. On the other hand, when you have a whole group and you have a real project to work on and you do it together, it is an enormous retention feature. So finding better work, meaningful work, and a pathway to succeed is a big part of it. The whole USC competes means you aren't going to hold on to people if you aren't making it possible for them to live here. Workplace flexibility is really important. Different parts of our university can have more flexibility than others, and we understand that, but everybody is thinking about it. So we're thinking about salary, compensation, we're thinking about flexibility, we're thinking about training, and I think we're even thinking at the faculty level of finding ways when people need to go off and build a company and try something new, that we're more flexible just in the way we think about what it means to be part of our university. And sometimes that means leaving it and coming back. So I think we're open to anything that will improve that. So if you have more ideas, please send them forward. I think about it for our students. You know, I mean, you can't even retain athletes for more than a season these <laughs> years, you know? The portal exists. So when that's out there, you've got to find ways that people want to stay. It's about wanting to stay. And so it's a big part of what we have to do. I think it's really important. Okay, last question. Do I see a role for retired faculty and staff to mentor health science students and pre-health undergraduates? You know what, I'm going to turn that to my colleagues because I know they've been thinking about that, but Carolyn or Steve, do you want to take that one on here? Yeah, I told you I'd pass <laughs> to somebody. Carolyn, there's a microphone up front to your right. Okay. Uh, yeah, we've been, we've certainly been engaging our alumni and uh, emeritus faculty much more, so I definitely think there's a role there and we can enhance it, and, and some of our um, alumni have been incredibly generous in supporting our students. Um, Donna, did you want to say anything further about that? <laughs> or, or, <laughs> okay, okay. Glad but to I, talk more about that, though. It's an important issue. It's such issue. a good that point, talent. you know, because I think all of us are kind of aware that, you know, as you, as you age, you also want to make room for new people. I mean, there's always a move. You know, I talked about all those new faculty coming in. On the other hand, some of us, like me, never want to stop working. We love it, you know, so I think that's always a balance, and you're all doing a lot of work making six, 60 the new 45, 70 the new 60. I mean, we're feeling better. We can go for a long time. So I do think that's another area where you're going to see start seeing more innovation. How do you keep this incredibly skilled workforce that may not need or want some of the other parts that make their full-time job active but make it a really great way to be uh, working. Last night we had Charlie Bolden, you know, the astronaut, head of NASA, you know, he was on our board of trustees. He's retired and he's busier than he's ever been. And I think to some extent, it's a great idea to think about how can we continue to engage that talent while also continuing to open doors for all the other talent that we're training. So that's a good one to end on. I'm sure you're all running off to a busy day. I just want to say thank you again, and I noticed some of you have come from a distance to be here, um, but it's just really a privilege to see all of you, so thank you. Thank you.